Well, I am so excited to be hanging out with you guys here tonight and in a room with lots of parents. I'm just curious who in here has a child or has just one child? Did we have just one child? All right, that was easy. I was trying to find, so how old is your child? 11 months. 11 months, awesome. Well, I have a, I was trying to find our newest parents in here, so that would be you guys. Um, I have a little prayers for my children packet um, that are a little more parts that you can go at the dinner table and just pray at your, over your kids um, through scripture, so enjoy those, you're welcome. Um, on the flip side, I'd love to know who has the most kids in this room. So if you have two or more kids, can you raise your hand? All right, if you have three or more kids, keep your hands raised. Four or more, keep them raised. Five or more, keep them raised. Okay, if you if you just had your hand up, so you guys, everybody that had four, keep your hand up. All right, now, Henry doesn't count. You can't get the cards. Um, send somebody to do rock, paper, scissors between the two of you to get the next one. <laughs> Me? Okay, what, is it rock, paper, scissors, shoot? Yes. Or is it, one, okay. two, three, go. Okay. <laughs> That's a, rock, paper. Ah. All right. All right, so I'm going to give you guys some gospel conversation cards. These are um, little questions and answers that you can use to ask gospel conversations around the table. So thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, so that um, helps me to kind of see who's in the room a little bit. I'd love to introduce you guys to me. Uh, my name is Kaylee, and I am the wife of my high school sweetheart, Taylor. And we've been married for nine years. We have a four-year-old son named Miles. He is obsessed with all things vehicles. Um, and a one-year-old named Oliver, who is obsessed with being wild. <laughs> um, when um, I was not a mother before I became a mom, I was the kids pastor at a church in West Lafayette, Indiana, called Northview Church. And I was there for about four and a half years as a kids pastor while my husband was pursuing his PhD uh, at Purdue University in mechanical engineering, and he got a job as a research scientist at 3M, and so we moved to Woodbury, Minnesota um, in January of 2020, right in time for COVID to hit. <laughs> so we spent a year knowing absolutely nobody, and we were thrilled when we found Five Oaks and have just jumped into community here and really just enjoy being a part of this church. So when I'm not being a wife or a mom, I... Well, don't know what to do with myself because I'm always being a wife or a mom. But in those spare moments that I do have, if I'm not napping, um, then I love to be creative. And I love to be creative in a lot of different ways. But one outlet that I had created since my uh, first son was born was, come on in, um, in a uh, outlet called The Pastor Mom, which is an account that I created on Instagram. And it was this idea that as parents, we get to be pastors for our kids at home. And as a kids pastor, it was my job to equip parents to do just that. It was my job to equip them to try to teach their kids about God. Um, but when I became a mom, I realized that that can be kind of hard. <laughs> and so uh, it became my passion to combine what I learned as a kids pastor with what I learned as a mother. And um, I created this account to help other parents be intentional about raising children who are after God's own heart in the time between Sundays. And so that's kind of what I want to talk with you guys about here today. So I'd like to just start off by acknowledging that parenting is really hard. Does anybody else feel me when I say that parenting can be hard? Um, I mean, not only are we combating our own physical and mental exhaustion, but we are also trying to raise well-rounded, spiritually mature little humans and not mess them up for the rest of their lives. So no pressure, right? Uh, but with so much on our plate as parents, we have the to-do lists, working, cleaning, meal planning, laundry, chauffeuring our kids here and there, regulating our kids' emotions, trying to keep up with our spouse relationship, our friendships, staying in God's word. There's so much that piles up. And then we throw in there the comparison and self-doubt that can be so easy to jump into as parents. Um, and then add in, especially for moms being touched out or overstimulated, and our brains and our bodies can just almost get into survival mode instead of really trying to be intentional. And so it's easy to lose sight of what really matters. It's easy to forget to talk about our faith with our kids and to be intentional with our time and our family on habits. And honestly, I feel like when I was a kids pastor, it was a lot easier for me to be intentional with our kids there at church than it is for me to be intentional with my kids at home because I had uninterrupted time and space to really just focus on that. 
And uh, as parents, we don't have that uninterrupted planning space a lot of times. And so all that being said, we are our kids' parents. And we are, get to have a weight that no one else carries for our child because we are the ones that get to steward them and nurture them and love them in ways that only we can as their parents. And I believe that God has placed a desire in your heart and in mine to see his best for our kids. And as parents, I think that we do all have good intentions when it comes to our kids' faith. But my question that I want to ask you today is, so as busy parents, how can we move from having good intentions for our kids to actually being intentional? And I think it's critical that we answer this question because without a doubt, parents are the number one spiritual influencers in the faith life of their children. More than pastors, more than small group leaders, more than social media or friends, parents are the ones that teach their kids about Jesus. And the real kicker is that the kids aren't just looking to their parents to see what they're saying to teach them about their faith, but they're looking to our actions as well. They want to see how we are living out our own everyday faith in our own everyday life. In their 2021 study on how parents pass their religion on to the next generation, Professor Christian Smith and his team from the University of Notre Dame found that the single most powerful causal influence on the religious lives of American teenagers and young adults is the religious lives of their parents. Now, the study didn't find that parents had to have perfect faith practices. Instead, they found that when kids saw their parents working out their own faith honestly over the long haul, it helped them understand both consciously and unconsciously that their parents really did believe what they said they believed. Additionally, in 2003, the Barna Group, which researches religious beliefs and behaviors in America, found that the probability of someone embracing Jesus as his or her savior was 32% between the ages of 5 and 12, 4% for those in the 13 to 18 age range, and 6% for people 19 and older. Ten years later, in 2015, the National Association of Evangelicals found similar findings that 63% of their members chose to follow Jesus between the ages of 4 and 14. In other words, as parents, we have this incredible opportunity to evangelize to our kids while they are under our roof, and particularly before they're teenagers. It's a time when they're looking to us as their spiritual guide, and also when they're the most fertile for us to plant seeds of faith in their hearts. And so it's incredibly vital that we answer this question, how can we move from having good intentions for our kids to actually being intentional. So I'd love to pray over our session here, and then we'll go ahead and dive into that question. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as I prepare to lead this session, would you work through me? Would you be glorified in it? Would this point to you and not to me? God, I'm not enough. I'm not the perfect parent, but you are. And in your infinite wisdom, can you lead us closer to you, God? I pray a blessing over each parent in this room, that you would help something in this session help them be more intentional with their kids as they go home today. Thank you for being such a kind and loving father. Amen. Amen. All right, so as we think about how we can move from having good intentions for our kids to actually being intentional, I think one of the first things that we need to do is to understand what are we being intentional about. And so I want to ask you guys that question. What are the good intentions that you have for your kids when it comes to their faith? And I'm going to encourage you to write those down. And if you're not sure where to start with that, we're going to have some time at the end of our session today to kind of flesh that out a little bit and come up with those for your own family. But just to give you an example, my husband and I went through a class that was called the Parenting Game Plan at my previous church that I worked at. And if you're interested in that, it's all online, and I've actually linked it in your um, handout that I gave you uh, if you want to look at that in the future. But these are a few good intentions that we wrote down from that class. And before I show it, I want to say that these are simplified for our sake here. So when you make your own good intentions, you're going to want to flesh these out a little bit more than what you just see on the screen. But for our sake here, these were some of the good intentions that my husband and I had created for our family. And they included these. In our family, we love and honor one another. We have fun. We understand that our worth comes from God. We put God first. We understand what we believe. We live out our faith. We display godly character qualities, and we're quick to give grace to ourselves and others. But whatever you and your spouse come up with for your family, you want to make sure that you know what it is that you're being intentional about. Because only then can you come up with a plan to make those
those good intentions a reality. When you know what you're running towards, it becomes much clearer the path that you need to take to get there. And that path is really going to be unique for each of us because every family is different, right? We each have different intentions, different personalities. We have different kids that are in different ages and stages of life. Maybe they have different learning styles. So there's not going to be one right path to being intentional in your parenting. But I do think there's a best path for you and for your family. And so when you've written down what it is that's most important to you, then you get to know what to pour your energy into and what to let go of to make sure those things happen. And that really means that we can't be looking to the right and to the left to see what other parents are doing because as parents, you know, we get so sucked into comparing ourselves with others. And I think that you just need to remember that God's best for your family is going to look different than God's best for somebody else's family. And so while it can be okay to look around you for ideas, which I, I hope that's what this is a little bit today, that we get some good ideas of how to be better at creating good intentions for our kids, um, really this needs to be a vertical decision between you and God before it can be a horizontal conversation with the families around you. So, like I said, too often as we compare ourselves with other parents, this is going to lead to shame and guilt and feeling bad about ourselves. And a lot of times we, we think that other families have it all together, that they have chosen the better path and that we're failing. But you don't know that family's full picture, and they don't know your whole story. And so when you feel those notice, or when you notice those feelings start to kind of creep in, where you're comparing and feeling like, oh, you know, they're doing this with their kids, I should be doing that, or whatever it might be, I want you to put blinders on and remember that you get to decide what's best for your family, and you can have the Holy Spirit help guide you in that, but God is really the only one that needs to approve once you've kind of written out your good intentions and how you flesh that out. God is the one that gets to approve that and not others. So once you've gotten those good intentions written down, I want you to think about your current stage of life in light of these good intentions. And when you think about your current stage of life, the ages of your kids, the rhythms of your current household, and I want you to ask yourself three questions. And those are gonna be what can we leverage what do we need to add, and what do we need to subtract? And as we explore these questions, we're gonna start small. So Kendra Adachi has a book called The Lazy Genius Way, and she coined this term, start small for me, and I fell in love with it. So there's gonna be a whole list of things in each of these categories that I cover today that you're gonna maybe feel pulled toward. And that's great, you know, hopefully someday you will have time to dig into each of those. But I think what we need to focus on today is coming out of here with one small thing we can leverage, one small thing we can add, and one small thing that we can subtract. Because if we try to do everything all at once, we're gonna leave here feeling overwhelmed and like we can't do it all, and we're not gonna actually implement anything. On the other hand, if we leave this session with a game plan and we have a small step that we can actually implement in our actual lives, then we can leave here feeling more confident that we'll actually make a difference in our kids' stage lives. And so keep that in mind as we go through, okay? As we come up with ideas, remember we want to start small because it's better to do one small thing than to fail at big kid things, right? All right, so we're going to start with this first question here. What can we leverage? And I'd like to start with this question because I think it's the easiest. It's this idea that we can leverage what we are already doing to be intentional with the time that we already have in front of us. We don't have to add more or shift our calendars around. We simply have to be intentional with what we already have. And I think that we can do this in three different ways. We can get creative, we can be opportunistic, and we can demonstrate it. So let's first talk, talk about how we can get creative. Since we've already thought about what our good intentions are and the age and stage of our kids, the next thing we want to think about is where are there pockets of time in our day that we already have our kids' attention naturally, right? Maybe it's around the breakfast table, or maybe it's on the drive to an activity when your kids are in the car with you. Um, it could be in that after school time where your kids have just gotten off the bus and you don't really know what to do in that time, or um, maybe it's in that bedtime sacred moment where kids are a little extra cuddly and open to deeper conversations. But whatever that time frame is for you, I want you to start thinking about what it would look like to capitalize on that time on a regular basis. And I want to ask yourself, is there a way that I could creatively tell my kids about God in this moment? And then depending on what it is that you've written down on your good intentions, that's going to help you determine what you fill that time with. Now, remember, this is going to look different for each of us, which is why I'm giving you a handout that has a few ideas in it of options that you can use depending on what your family is looking for. 
But for creativity's sake, here are some things that my family has done to sprinkle intentionality into our days in the time that we already have. And all these things I'm going to mention are also listed in your handout, so don't feel like you have to write all these down if you don't want to. But at breakfast time um, a few years ago, I noticed that my son was really uh, paying attention to the songs that he was listening to as we played them over breakfast time. And at the time, it was Everything is Awesome, and I like to move it on repeat. <laughs> and I would notice him singing those songs all morning long, and so it clicked. If I switch the songs that we listen to in the morning, then I switch what's on repeat in his mind throughout the day. And so now, I like to put on music that sings scripture and theology over my boys as they eat breakfast. There are amazing artists like the Risers and the Village Kids and the New City Catechism for Kids that put scripture and theology to music. And so my kids are learning God's word without even trying. During my son's quiet time, he was asking to listen to stories. And so I worked smarter and not harder and introduced him to the podcast, God's Big Story. And with that, um, it's a podcast that talks all about God's word. It goes into different topics. Um, and really just dives deep into some topics of the Bible. And my son has learned so much just from listening to this podcast. And so um, we've actually gone through the whole series, I think, twice now. And he keeps asking to start it back over because, in his words, learning about Jesus is pretty important. <laughs> um, hey, real quick. Yeah. Um, a lot of your resources are on here. Just so if you miss it, you don't have to ask somebody. So. Yes, I did say that. Oh, you did. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I missed that. Sorry. That's okay. Other uh, people might have missed it too, so I appreciate you clarifying. Okay, I don't want you to feel like you have to scramble. Um, so yeah, during my son's preschool time, then I noticed we were singing songs about the weather and the days of the week, uh, and so I decided to throw in a song about the books of the Bible so that he could kind of learn to navigate God's word. Um, and then we'd go ahead and practice our memory verse for church as we were going through our schoolwork so that he would get in the habit of making it a part of his normal routine to think about God's word. When we're on walks in the mornings, my son is constantly talking and asking questions. And if I have the forethought, forethought to do so, it's easy to just ask him questions back. Um, notice the things around us on our walk. Hey, who made the sky? Who made the trees? Or if we see a storm rolling in, ask him, hey, what do you think it would have been like if, you know, you were on the boat with Jesus when that big storm was rolling in, and he just stood up and said, be still, and the storm just stopped and was quiet. What do you think that was like? Do you think God still does stuff like that today? What, what does that mean for our hearts? And I think doing stuff like that can really grab our kids' attention and help them know that their faith can intersect with their everyday lives. At dinner time, we try to pray for one of our mission partners that we support, and we talk about what they're doing in different parts of the world and how they're needing prayer. And this uh, opens up his eyes to the idea of evangelism and the global church and being generous. As one of my son's bedtime books, we always end with a Bible study or a devotion, and then we say a prayer that we try to have him help with in hopes of teaching him how to pray and how to have a daily habit of reading God's word. Later, as we leave his room, we read a blessing over him from scripture. And then he falls asleep listening to music, and one of the albums of his own rotation is the Scripture of All Abides album that once again sings Scripture over him to memorize without even trying. Now, I will say these are not things that I do every single day. These are not things that I do perfectly. But when I even do some here and there, sprinkled throughout my day, I think it makes an impact in my son's faith. And I think that is going to look different, obviously, for different families, right? If your kids are older than my kids, or if you don't stay home with your kids, your routine is going to look a lot different than mine is. But you can still be intentional in these ways by using the pockets of time that you already have. A friend of mine that has some older kids said this, we love the Bible Project podcast because the guys are so smart, go deep, and get into hard questions and concepts. We intentionally expose the kids to this very intellectual and almost academic feeling podcast because of the world they are facing. We want them to understand their faith and know that they can question it, wrestle with it, and ultimately be able to discuss it. We drive a ton and often listen to this. The kids aren't always fully attentive, but we will sometimes pause to discuss parts and they will comment. So I know they're listening even when they aren't fully engaged. I love that we use the drive time in that way. And obviously, Pastor Henry loves the Bible Project, um, but find what works for you and for your family. My handout has some ideas. 
uh, your kids and student pastor have ideas, ask parents around you what they use, or just be creative in coming up with something for your family in those pockets of time that you already have. And once you start leveraging that time, one thing that you can kind of do to take this a step further is get curious about the things that they're learning. If we want our kids to have a heart faith and not just a head faith, a faith that actually applies to their lives and feels real to them, then we need to help them connect the language of faith to their everyday lives. And so we want to be quick to ask them questions about the verses they're memorizing. How does that actually affect your life? Or the podcast they're listening to. Hey, does that spark anything in you? Does that make you want to do anything or change anything? Um, when we start to engage with them and not just teach them, then our impact can be twofold. So as we can see, sometimes we get to be creative when we're leveraging the time that we already have. And we can bring those conversations into something that we're already doing. But there's also going to be times and opportunities to have intentional conversations with our kids arise naturally. And it's crucial that we're slowed down enough and present enough and listening well enough to be opportunistic with our kids. So if your child's struggling with something or wrestling with something or doubting something, this is an incredible opportunity to teach them how to go to God with these things. Instead of giving our children easy answers or being afraid to enter into the hard conversations, we can open up our Bibles with our kids and direct them to the source of all answers and let them know that the God of the Bible is also the God of their everyday lives. My four-year-old might have accepted Jesus a few months ago, and I say might have because that same day he told me that he didn't like God because he couldn't see him. Um, and four years old is a little bit younger than I would typically say somebody can make that decision. But at the very least, we had a full cool conversation about the gospel because I let him question his faith. At Five Oaks' VBS program, he sang an updated and upbeat version of the song, This Little Light of Mine. And so I thought it would be a good idea to introduce him to the song, This Little Light of Mine, that I sang when I was a child. And we got to the part that said, don't let Satan get out. And he said, Mommy, who's Satan? <laughs> which opened a whole can of worms because he also didn't know what hell was, and so we went there. Um, and after a lot of questions, um, I told him that Satan lived in hell and he didn't want anyone to follow Jesus, and so he tried to blow out our light, but that Jesus defeated Satan, and that he's more <coughs> powerful. And that actually didn't quench his curiosity because hell's a really big subject, and so he asked a lot more questions. Um, and so I told him that that's why it's such a big deal that Jesus took the consequence for our sins, because he died on the cross for us, we won't have to go to hell. Now, we had also been reading this book from the Tales That Tell the Truth series called The Awesome, Super, Fantastic Forever Party, and it's a book that talks about Jesus' invitation to everyone to live with him forever. And so I told him that he didn't have to worry about going to hell as long as he accepted Jesus' invitation. And he said, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, buddy, you just have to say yes. And so at 8 o'clock in his dark room, he just yelled, yes! I was like, well, you know, we might want to have a salvation prayer. So I told him what that was. He said he wanted to do it, and we prayed together. And will this stick? I don't know. Only time will tell. We're not going to be phased if it doesn't. But it's conversations like these that are so important to faith. We can't be afraid to talk about the hard topics. We can't be too rushed at bedtime to not be open to faith conversations. We must be in tune with our kids' everyday lives and what they're learning so we can prompt good conversations. I have a friend that has five kids, and she talked about being intentional in this way. She said, I think the best advice that I could give for raising teenagers is to be ready to talk when they are. Don't be scared of their questions and ask good questions. I don't know what it is about late night, but for years that has been when my kids always want to talk. It started when they were young, but it started to feel crucial as they've gotten older. And use your drive time. So many of our bigger conversations happen then. So often my instinct is to be scared of their tough questions, to be specific, a fear of that questioning leading them away from their faith. But being willing to dig into the hard stuff with them is so important. Another way that we can be opportunistic with our kids is with what they're consuming. There are so many open doors to faith conversations when we know what our kids are reading and watching, what they're listening to, what they're talking about at school, what they're talking about with their friends, what they're seeing on social media. It doesn't have to be Christian content for it to have a lot of tie-ins to their faith and to their life. And so we want to look for ways to be opportunistic in those conversations as well. And just so nobody feels overwhelmed, I want to remind everybody that we don't have to have all the answers as parents. 
When we go to have conversations with our kids and they ask us hard questions, it's okay to admit that we don't know the answers either, but it's important to commit to them that we will work on figuring out those answers together. Because when we connect with them in these matters and when we listen to them, that's actually one of the most important things that we can do to guide their faith because they feel safe to bring those questions to us. One last practice that I want to talk about in this idea of leveraging the time that we already have is this um, idea of demonstrating it. And what I mean by that is that we already talked about that the religious lives of parents is the most powerful influence on the religious lives of kids. And so we need to take a minute and talk about the importance of our own faith and the importance of our kids seeing us practice our own faith. And I say these two things separately because I think there really is a difference. If we're just putting on a show for our kids and we're reading our Bible and praying and living out our faith only when they are around in hopes that they'll do it too, they're going to see right through that. Kids are smart and they can smell hypocrisy from a mile away. So we have to ask ourselves honestly, are we living a faith life that we want our kids to catch? Is God first in our own life? Does our everyday life look different because of our relationship with Jesus changes us? And if not, we have to start here. And that's okay, right? None of us have it all figured out. We're all on a faith journey. And I unfortunately don't have time today to go into all the different ways that you can grow your faith authentically, <coughs> even in the small pockets of time that you have as a parent. But I would encourage you to reach out to one of our Five Oaks pastors, take a Story of God class, um, get into a women's study or a men's study, or there are resources on your handout as well, some things that I've used to grow my faith. But wherever you're at, I want you to passionately pursue your own faith. Because your kids seeing you chase after Jesus might just be the most impactful thing on their faith journey. And your kids seeing you say you're chasing after Jesus, but seeing that you're not actually, can also be the most impactful thing on their own faith journey. Remember, it's not about doing it perfectly, it's about doing it authentically. And with that, if you are sincere in your faith, and you're praying, and you're reading your Bible, and living out your spiritual disciplines, but you're only doing it in private, your kids will have no idea that those things are a part of your daily routine with the Lord. And so it's important that you have this healthy balance of making it real and authentic between you and God, but also making it public enough that your kids see it. And when it comes to demonstrating your own faith life with your kids, it can be as simple as moving your Bible reading from your phone to a physical Bible, or from your bedroom or office to out in the open on like the living room or a dining room table. And yes, this will open you up to more distractions and it will open you up to more questions. But when you read something interesting or if they ask you what you're reading, then you can tell them about it right then and there. When I'm cooking dinner, I often like to play worship music and my son will ask me if I'm listening to Jesus music. And just this idea that he knows that mommy worships is powerful for him to grow up knowing. A parent friend of mine said, I realized a couple years ago that the kids never saw my Bible time because I waited until they left for school to read. I started adding some reading to the afternoon while they were doing their homework or intentionally just read a bit when they were around. My spouse and I talk about what we've read, share interesting things or things we've learned with the kids, and just generally try to speak with excitement and joy about scripture. I made a big deal about reading the Bible in a year last year and celebrated a bit on the last day with the family. Not an actual celebration, although that would have been fun. I just talked about it, shared my accomplishment, how enjoyable it was, and how I would miss reading every day. What our kids see us do matters. So let's not forget to leverage it to impact our kids' faith. All right, so the second question that I want us to explore as we consider how we can turn the good intentions for our kids into a reality is do you need to add something to what you're already doing? Now, this is a little bit of a sensitive question because, to be honest, we are all busy, right? We all already have so much on our plates. But I do think that there are some things that are worth adding to our schedule if the result is impacting the eternity of our children. And remember, childhood is this unique time of life where our kids are looking to us and they're hungry for God, and we want to capitalize on this fertile time to impact their faith. And in this world, we can feel all kinds of pressure to fill our schedule with many nice to do things, right? Ac extracurriculars, lessons, events, academics, clubs, meetings, hangouts, you name it. And you or your kids might think that you really need those things. But there's only one thing that you need to do as a parent, and that is to love God. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So how can we figure out if we need to add something to our schedule? And I think the best place to start is that list of good intentions that we're going to talk about, like I said, at the end of our session today. As you look at that list, I want you to think about, is there anything on there that you don't feel like your family's currently doing to instill those things in your children? Is there anything on your family's schedule that could benefit from adding a rhythm or a habit to? If so, you can start there. And remember, we want to start small, right? We aren't trying to overwhelm ourselves. And so if you need to narrow down some ideas, some good questions to ask yourself is what could be the most impactful thing for me to add or even what could be the easiest thing for me to add and start there. For my family, it was the need for a Sabbath. In an effort to be intentional about putting God first, having fun as a family, and living out our faith, over the past couple of years, we've tried to be intentional about having a weekly Sabbath. Now, I'm going to admit that Sabbath's a pretty big topic, and I'm just on the front end of kind of figuring exa out exactly what a true Sabbath looks like. But for my family, we currently understand Sabbath like this. as a weekly rhythm of stopping our striving for an entire day and resting in Christ's completeness. It's a day where we explore our passions, we set work aside, we enjoy time as a family. My husband and I take turns watching kids so that we can rest in the ways that we need to. We get outside, go to church, eat leftovers, bake cookies, light candles, have friends over, leave the dishes in the sink, whatever we need to do to refresh our souls and remind ourselves that we're human and that God is the one who is in control. And it's a day of delight and possibilities and one that we look forward to each week. But I'll be honest, Sabbath is not something that comes naturally to me. I strive and I want to produce and I need to finish the things that are on my list. And these are things that are fighting to enter onto my calendar on a Sabbath. But Sabbath is something that my family and I need. We need to realize that when I can't finish it all, that God is the only one who can provide for all of my needs. And so I find it worth the effort to add something to my schedule. And I am not perfect at it. In fact, in practicing this session, I might have skipped a few Sabbaths um, <laughs> as we prepared for this. But when we do set aside one day a week that's off limits to busy, and when we practice it, we are always grateful that we did. And hopefully as our sons grow up with, a part, with this as a part of their weekly routine, they'll adopt it as their own as well. Another thing that I try to add to my schedule is a practice of prayer. Prayer has always been a spiritual discipline that's been the hardest for me. And I, when I say I'm trying to add it, I really mean that I'm trying. <laughs> I have failed so many times, but I know that it's important. I know that ultimately I have no control over what my kids believe or don't believe. And I know that without the Holy Spirit, I am not a wise and loving and patient mother. And so I know that it's important to pray. Paul Miller in his book, A Praying Life, says this about prayer. He says, if you aren't praying, you are quietly confident that time, money, and talent are all you need in life. But if you, like Jesus, realize you can't do life on your own, then no matter how busy or tired you are, you will find the time to pray. So I'm trying to add prayer into my schedule. And if you are also wanting to do that, I've included some ways that I try to do that in your resource. And maybe you can pick one of those and try it out in the next few days and see how it goes for you. Or maybe you want to add a Sabbath to your family or daily Bible reading or maybe weekly church attendance, jumping into a small group or something that's completely unique to you and to your family and what you guys need. I asked a friend of mine who has four adult children who are all following the Lord, what she and her husband did to be intentional in adding things into their schedule. And she said this, we intentionally chose to say yes to church retreats, conferences, mission trips, and any events that we thought would be faith building in our kids' lives. It was expensive at times, but we gave up other things to be able to say yes to those things. Some things are worth saying yes to. So what's one thing that your family needs to say yes to? The last question that I want us to talk about as we think about how we can turn our good intentions into reality <coughs> for our kids' lives is, do we need to subtract something? Do we need to subtract something that we're already doing to make space for something better? It's not news to anyone that we live in an overscheduled and overstimulating world. 
And as parents, I think we feel the brunt of it because not only is our own lives overstimulating and overscheduled, but we get to throw in our kids' overscheduled and overstimulating lives on top of ours and somehow manage it all. But to be honest, I don't think that a lot of us are managing it all. Instead, I think a lot of us are drowning. And if somebody is drowning, then getting ideas, routines, or habits to learn how to be a better swimmer, it's not going to help them get out of the water. What they need is a life raft. And I think parents to kids of all ages and stages can feel like they're drowning, but to be intentional parents, we can't be drowning. And maybe the life raft that we need is to say no to some things. And it might be really hard no's. It might be no's to some of your heart's desires or your kids' heart's desires. But what if those no's allowed you to say yes to something greater? What if subtracting something is one of the most important things that we can do for their faith and ours? Maybe instead of leveraging what we're already doing or adding something to our schedule, maybe the holiest thing that we can do is to stop doing something else. Because when I look at Jesus, he wasn't drowning. He had a lot of people that needed him, and yet he had time for others. He was never too busy. He wasn't always rushing around. He was able to be present. And that's not to say that he didn't have places to go or things to do. He didn't say no to everything. But his schedule was open enough for time with his father, time with his friends, and time for his work. And I think he was able to love others well, partly because he had the margin to do so. And so as parents, we set the tone for our homes, right? We get to decide if our homes are places where we have margin or places where everyone's running around and frazzled and there's no time for conversations or interruptions. And too many times I find myself, like Martha from Luke 10, up and doing and serving all in the name of the Lord while her sister Mary sits and seemingly does nothing but listen at Jesus' feet. And as Martha gets huffy about this, Jesus tells her this. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. If we're not allowing space, for our family and ourselves to sit at the Lord's feet. If our schedules are too tight to allow for moments of intentionality in our home, something has to change. But subtracting things from our schedules and our lives is gonna be hard. It's not going to be comfy. If it were easy and comfortable, we would have already said no, right? Why would we say yes to something that's making us drown if it wasn't because we loved it or because we wanted it in our lives? So I wanna ask again, what do you need to subtract? And how do we even make that decision? Once again, I'm gonna ask that we start with that list of good intentions. And as you see that list and you see where the gaps are and what you're wanting to do for your kids versus what you actually are doing for your kids, I want you to think about if there's anything that comes to mind that's making that more difficult. And maybe you need to subtract that thing. Maybe it's an extracurricular that's bringing your family all around town too many nights of the week so you're never at home with all of your kids. Or maybe it's a serving opportunity of yours that's keeping you away at a time when your kids really need you. But there are other less noticeable things that we might need to say no to as well. For instance, maybe we need to say no to you or your kids making plans on Saturdays so that you can have intentional time together as a family. Others of you might need to say no to having a perfectly clean house because spending time with your family is more important than cleaning. And that one sounds like a silly one, but that one was true for me. My schedule was admittedly overfilled this last semester. I had said yes to too many volunteer opportunities and it left a lot of the housework to pile up. And so that meant on the time that I did have with my family in the evenings or on the weekend, I was constantly trying to pick up instead of really spending time with my kids and my husband. And I was always rushed and irritable. I felt like I never had time to rest. And so when I made the mental shift to let the house go a little bit, to leave my playroom unpicked up, to leave dishes in the sink, to not leave my yard that looked awful, and to maybe not mop the floor for a couple of weeks at a time. When I just let it go, I was able to be a more present and joyful mother. I wasn't as rushed or rude, and I was able to focus on what did matter, which was having fun with my family. And maybe the opposite is true for you, right? Maybe a dirty house and a unkempt yard would make you ragey, and so that's what you need to prioritize to be a good parent to your kids. But only you get to decide what that is for your family. Another less noticeable item that might need to be subtracted from what we're doing is time on our devices. How much of our time are we on our phones when we're around our kids? 
The book, The Tech Wise Family, is a great resource on using tech wisely in our families, and it mentions a healthy rhythm for devices is taking one hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year that the whole family turns off their phones to worship, feast, play, and rest together. We also encourage other natural boundaries, such as car time being drive or conversation time and not scrolling time. And that really just opens conversations to arise in the car without you mindlessly scrolling and not paying attention to what everybody else might be thinking about. And I don't know if you're like me, but I'm more addicted to my phone than I would like to be. Whether I'm on my phone to be productive, to catch up with friends, if I'm mindlessly scrolling, or maybe because I don't even know why it's in my hand, I just picked it up because I'm so used to picking it up, our kids don't know what we're doing. All they see is a head and a phone. And so maybe we need to subtract this from our life. I'm preaching to myself here when I say this, but maybe we need to be more intentional and present with our kids by putting our phones down. Or maybe for you it's TV or taking work calls and emails. Maybe you could do that after your kids go to bed or the next day during work. And I don't want to oversimplify this because this one in particular is going to be really personal and unique because what needs to be cut by one family might actually be what's bringing another family closer together. For instance, the extracurricular that's bringing your family to drive all around town and is keeping you from having intentional conversations with your kids might be what another family is using to have intentional conversations with their kids. And so this is going to look personal. And I get that in today's world with academics and sports, and it can be so cutthroat that <coughs> even missing one thing can feel like a blow to your child's entire trajectory. And our culture is gonna tell us that we don't have a choice. We have to sign up for the activity. But if we don't go to the meeting that we're gonna miss out, if we don't sign up for whatever it might be, it's going to have consequences. But sometimes <coughs> it's worth it to stop and think if that's really true. Will you really miss out by saying no, or will you gain back something greater? Will you gain back important time with your family? Will you gain back impacting the eternity of your kids? Will you gain respect from other parents who are desperate to make the same choices that you are? Will you gain back what really matters? And remember, there's gonna be lots of nice to do things that we can do as parents, but only one thing truly matters, and that is loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and teaching our kids to do the same. And only you as parents can make these priority decisions for your family of what gets cut from your schedule and what doesn't, but I do think it's important that you sit down and have these conversations because if you don't make these decisions, they're going to be made for you. And before you know it, your calendar is going to be filled up and too busy and too full to be intentional about what really matters. I think it's worth mentioning, too, that not every good thing that comes our way is ours to do. I think sometimes it's easy to only think of non-spiritual things when we're thinking about things that we need to subtract, but we have to prioritize our top priorities out of the many good options that we're given. And I know that that can be difficult, but sometimes I think some of us might be so busy serving others that we aren't serving our first responsibility, our family well, and that's got to change too. So whatever it might be for you, I want you to take some time and think if there's something that needs to be subtracted from what you're already doing to help you in naturally being more intentional with your kids. So we're going to get started um, shifting gears here in just a minute. I'm going to give you some time to actually come out of here with a plan, and I want you to think about things that you can leverage, add, or subtract from your schedule. But as we start to wrap this up, I do want to remind you that your parenting doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. God has that covered for you. We are all going to mess up. Parenthood is deeply sanctifying in a way that nothing else is. But all that we're called to do is lean into our Heavenly Father, who is the perfect parent, and steward what he's given to us, which is our beloved children. And that's going to look different for each of us. And God has equipped you uniquely to be the parents for your kids. And so we're going to try things. And sometimes they're going to work, and sometimes they're not. And so we're going to pivot and try something else. And these things that you're going to write down as you think about how you want to change your schedules, I would encourage you to reevaluate them every year or so. Because the reality is that your kids are going to change, your schedules are going to change, you are going to change, but largely the good intentions that you write down should stay the same. And so change the method as needed, but try to always stay the course with your intentions. And if you notice that you've gotten off track, it's never too late to get back on. And I can't end this session without talking about one elephant in the room, and that's that we must remember that our children have free choice. We can be as intentional as we want to be, but our children get to choose for themselves what they believe and what they don't believe. And some of you might already be in a spot where your kids don't believe in the God that you love. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you with this. 
Uh, Keith Farron, in his book, Like Ice Cream, The Scoop on Helping the Next Generation Fall in Love with God's Word, says God is the perfect father. And many of his children develop, God is perfect. His parenting is perfect. His love is perfect. Every decision he makes regarding his children is for their good. And yet so many walk away. So many rebel. So many don't even care. He has not forced anyone to love, serve, obey, and glorify him. He longs for them to want that relationship again or for the first time. Does his heart ache and break? Absolutely. Does he understand your discouragement and confusion? Yes. Is he present with you in this season of not knowing what will be for your children? Most definitely. He has not given up on you. He has not given up on your children. After all, they are not just your children. They are his children too, and he loves them. So keep fighting the good fight for your children and know that they were God's children first. We only get to one shot to be the parent of our kids. So we want to do it with everything that we have. And as moms or dads or grandparents or step-parents or foster parents, you name it, we get to steward and nurture and love our kids in ways that only we can. We get to our prove to our kids every day that they are valuable and worthy and talented, incredible people that were made in the image of the Most High God who loves them even more than we do. We get to be a glimpse of the unconditional love that our Heavenly Father gives to us. And while it's easy to get tired and exasperated with our families at times, maybe have a poor tone or an unkind word or a snippy attitude, we have to remember that having a warm and affirming relationship with our kids is perhaps more important than the religious instruction that we give because if they don't think that we're proud of them, if they don't know that we think that they're amazing, if they don't know with certainty that we love being their parents, then they might not take the other things that we say to them to heart. But when our kids believe that they are loved, and when they believe that they were made on purpose and for a purpose, when they grab our faith as their own and they run with it, it changes things. It changes their confidence in who they are. It changes who they hang out with and what they think they're capable of. It changes their outlook and their joy and their hope. And in a world that's raging with anxiety and depression in teenagers, goodness, it gives you more joy and hope. So make sure that your kids know that you love them. Make sure that they know that God loves them. And if you're leveraging the time that you have, adding things into your schedule to be intentional with your children's faith, and subtracting the distractions that are keeping you from those intentions, I believe that you will see fruit from those practices. So I do want to give you guys some time to actually come out of here with a plan. Um, I had the questions here. And you also have some on your table here. So you guys have two packets in front of you. You're one packet says, what are my family values? If you are struggling with coming up with what your good intentions are, this is a nice little worksheet to do that with. So I'm gonna give you um, about 10 minutes or so, just individually, to have some time to think about what these are for your family. Um, if you look at page three of that, what are my family values packet, there's some biblical values there. If you just wanna look at those and pull some from there, you're welcome to do that. This was a uh, resource that my old church created, but I do think it's a, a worthwhile resource to go through at some point. Um, but if you're just kind of looking for a good idea of some words that stick out to you, that might be a good place to start. Your other packet on that first page has some brainstorming space for you to start thinking about, you know, what do the good intentions want to be for your family? What can you leverage? What can you add? What can you subtract? And then what's one small step that you want to try to do? You can either do that just one small step period, or you can do one small step for each of those things. Um, so I'm going to give you about 10 or 15 minutes to just kind of do that on your own individually. And then um, I will kind of call you back together for this. But there are table questions on your table that will kind of allow you to talk through some of this with your table after that. So um, I will go ahead and get some music on and we can get started with that.